Good day, ladies and gents. This is the Ecclesiarch here, back with yet another episode of Forgecast. And I'm sure that this is one that you've all been waiting for. And it's also a special one, because finally, once again, it's not only mine and BJ's faces you're going to be looking at. Well, actually, you're not going to be looking at my <laughs> face at all, because my Discord has been going crazy. But I got the squad here. So I got BJ, Long Tim, and Barrick. So, BJ, first of all, say hi. Yeah. Hi, yo, how's it going? Doing well, doing well. Nice to have you back for the millionth time. <laughs> <laughs> not, not those two again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And once again, we got Tim returning to the channel. Tim? Hello, hello. It's uh, it's sad not to see uh, Attila return this week, but, you know, I'll, I'll live. I'll live. <laughs> we'll, we'll, do, we'll do better next time. We'll do better next time. <laughs> And last, but by no means the least, we got Barrick. Hello, y'all. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. I've uh, been uh, listening to a couple of these before, and it's nice now to be able to come on here and share my thoughts with y'all. And thank you for joining. Yeah, good to have you. Sure. Episode 10, we made double figures, Ecclesiac. Who'd have yeah, thought it? Yeah, so we're Who'd here. It? It's been a while, but we are here. So, yeah. And as I said, this is going to be a special episode, guys. For those of you who do not know, we had this little survey here, uh, which is meant to basically collect some information on both like customer satisfaction, as well as certain things that the players perhaps want to see in the game or want to see uh, fixed, want to see changed, things that people like, don't like. And surprisingly enough, we have like 101 responses, which first of all, thank you all for taking the time for doing because this is big i really did not expect to have so many and this is going to be a huge help and we're going to be sending this directly to Everguild. and i also hope that they listen to this episode of forgecast because we're going to be breaking it down boys it's going to be a big thing so uh guys what do you think maybe before we get to the responses just quickly go over the questions so that people know what it's going what we're on about yeah it's looking yeah it sounds good man okay can everybody see the Mm, survey yes yeah. yes yeah yes. okay super so uh gentlemen uh first of all we have basically some uh open questions which is what do you enjoy the most about uh in warforge like what is what is the thing that you find most frustrating or enjoy the least in warforge then we have this one overall satisfaction how satisfied you are then we have what key changes you would make uh, to increase the score. And after that, for each faction, we have this little scale where we say, so how uh, fun is the faction to play? So we have, for example, the Necron faction is incredibly fun to play. And how much do you agree? And that is done for every single faction. This is actually the one that's very interesting to look over. Uh, then we also have the question, what makes a faction fun to play? This is also pretty interesting. Uh, then there is a question that actually I had like one or two people criticize a bit. They said that this was not uh, a like a good question. Do you think the animations in the game need to be sped up? But we'll, we'll be the judge of that after the responses, I would say. Uh, what do you think is the bigger priority for the game currently? Do you think any of these cars need to be reverted? And here, guys, we have like some of the changes that most of the people have been kind of complaining about, like saying that perhaps it was not the best change. Well, with the exception of the Angels of Death, however, with uh, how much the game has progressed and changed, perhaps it might be a good idea to actually revert this card back to how it was. As for the Lich Guard, Ural Ventress Extra Card, and Hexmark Destroyer, well, these are all the changes that a lot of people have been questioning. Then we have a interesting one saying, what do you think should be done about weaker warlords? And we have some interesting options here. And this is just a an example of what a special card would look like. So essentially, if anybody doesn't know, in Horus Heresy Legions, some of the mm, 35 or 30 HP warlords used to have a special card that they could use one time only per game that kind of gave them identity. The next question is, should we uh, include the initiative system from Horus Heresy Legions, which was basically initiated from very low, low, medium, high, very high, and the Warlord with higher initiative always goes first. And then it was a question about the overtime mechanic and what people really think about it, so whether or not it needs changes or should stay the same. <laughs> And then probably the most important one for me personally is that should there be a testing environment where players will have a chance to uh, access and try out 
patches and new content before they go live in order to give Evergill some feedback. And if the answer to that question is yes, the question is who should have access to that content. And finally, extra comments. So without further ado, let's take a look at responses and let's actually also go over them and let's have a discussion on them so that you guys don't only hear me <laughs> just reading things <laughs> out. So that could have got pretty boring. So guys, the first question here was, what do you enjoy the most in Warforge? And before we dive into individual answers, I'd like to ask you guys. So Tim, personally, what do you enjoy the most in Warforge? Uh, this is such a tough question because I feel like there are just so many things, but I, I think what grabs me aside from, uh, and there, there's a con comment that alludes to this, like the, the lore, the factions, uh, the music, like definitely the aesthetic and the atmosphere of the game for card games stands out, I think, in a very positive way for me and really grabbed me. And uh, I think just I've always been really drawn to like diving into an identity of like a faction or a play style. Um, and I think I've really was I was in Space Marines, you know, kind of standard person. Um, and, you know, could really dive into, oh, I want to try these decks and these cards. Oh, I remember these models from, you know, when I was younger. It just kind of hits on, um, you know, an IP that I'm interested in, but also I think does deliver a pretty, like, high-quality product in terms of how it looks and how it feels for me. That is beautiful. What about Beric? Yeah, so for sure the 40K environment is a very nice um, aesthetic and so, you know you guys have some awesome units from a variety of factions that like a lot of people can find something cool in and so I've I've been a 40k fan for quite a while now and I play a lot of card games and so like Hearth or uh, Hearthstone I did wasn't really in the World of Warcraft stuff as much but like it was a good it was a solid card game and so uh, over here I think some degree, Warp Forge even has uh, like a more in-depth combat system with two range, uh, two different attack values, and what I would think in most strategies less um, less RNG dependent than other online card games. And you're tying in that like very cool 40k setting that a lot of people have fond memories of, like uh, Tim was saying for quite a while. So that's it's kind of like the sweet spot between those two things. All right, so BJ, what about you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I build on what the guys have said. I mean, obviously, I've got I'm a bit biased in that. I, I worked for Games Workshop for eight and a half years, and um, so I have a very strong affiliation with the the IP. I also played in uh, the tournament scene and ran a pretty good, pretty well known um, uh, tournament podcast at the time called Forty K UK. Uh, let 40k global so I've, I've always loved like the the, the background and, and but i think the thing is is any developer could have taken that and that would have been true but i think they have done a really great job in executing uh the the you know even like the audio we've talked about the audio right before of how uh, the different factions bullets sound when they when they you know they've just nailed that and i also just think just from a card game perspective like they've really they've really nailed the very basic core mechanics of the back and forth gameplay are very good. It's something that made Hearthstone addictive in the first instance. And it really feels like Hearthstone plus in many ways, like the original Hearthstone plus with it, with it, with, it, with a few extra trimmings without making it too complex. Like Rune Terror was a great game, but some people said it kind of went too complicated and it took forever just to resolve one turn. Um, I think I think what they've done in Warp Forge is get a really good balance, and the basic back and forth of the gameplay is is a lot of fun. Um, and I also really liked <clears throat> just collecting. I quite like the premium campaigns. I thought the campaigns were a lot of fun, and it was nice recently to have the Tau again and to kind of experience that collecting. I almost wish they'd they would sort of extend them in a way, especially when the reinforcement drops come out and. But uh, yeah, that's that's the main thing that I really do like about Walt Forge. Yeah, for me, it would be like quite simple. Um, once again, it's the aesthetic as well as how EG actually manages to implement the whole 40k theme there. I also played Legions, as you guys know, and in Legions, it was also done in a 
perfect way, especially the voice acting, the whole faction mechanics, for example, Night Lords having terror, uh, Emperor's Children having perfection, so such interesting stuff. And they've kept the same thing in Warforge, and I overall, that's what kind of gets me, because it's it, it, it has something that really does manage to captivate you, so that's definitely uh, the thing for me. So... It's also interesting to now see what the other players think, right? So let's mm -hmm. quickly take a look. And number one answer, I'll, I'll just quickly go through. There's going to be some big comments as well, and then we can discuss so the launch. <laughs> I guess it was the launch, I guess, perhaps. Uh, nothing is worth mentioning. Uh, combo decks, as always, EG manages to implement the lore of the faction as well. The music is awesome. 40k setting, playing the faction I like the most. The setting, once again, and complexity of ranged and melee options. This is probably a Legion's player, because we, there we did not have that. 40k setting, sound and animations, but last but not least, the community. The core me mechanics of the game design and excellent IP, visuals, audio. The devs will listen on important issues. Premium campaigns are great for collecting. Wish we could see extensions. I think this is BJ's comment. So, <laughs> deck building, <laughs> card combination of synergies. Uh, special cards, uh, offense cards. I would like to see them use that. Okay, or just play cards with the action versus the mechanics, each housing, 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 so yeah the thing about the, the thing about what some of us said there yeah. about like the 40k the theme and the basic game design i think that's coming through quite a lot isn't it as a as a as a consistent thing exactly that's what i wanted to say so i think it's kind of easy to summarize it because even though there's like a couple of different comments in there i think the most uh mostly the two things that i've seen is that people love the ip people love the theme people love how it's been implemented as we mentioned how let's say faithful it is to the lore and they like how diverse it is with melee and range attack and so on so i think it's pretty much the same thing even even the bigger comments here are pretty much same the same thing and one thing actually i also noticed come up a lot is people are saying we love combo decks <laughs> and special decks is that is that a joke because i i don't know of a whole lot of combo decks in the game other than maybe like scarabs must must be the tyranid players uh -huh. I guess I guess you could yeah some of that's considered combo drawing that one card combos I mean I guess Ecclesia your chaos deck was a combo deck in many ways um, orcs until Gordran re released often was a combo deck right in terms of getting like um, the green horde combos off and stuff like that you know the big massive swing turns um, yeah but it's probably less so now right. Current meta is less. I think the current meta is a lot less combo oriented. One thing about uh, that is it really depends on the meta, as you said. When mm. there's a healthy meta, you might see some combo decks. When there's like very specific, you might or might not, depending on the meta. For example, when there was the Gaskell meta, a lot of Abaddons were playing for combo. Uh, then there was also the Swarmlord playing for combo. And as Beric mentioned, there's also the Scarab one. But now a lot of things have changed. Overall, I think the picture is kind of clear. Uh, it's like uh, mostly people love the aesthetic and the lore and design and all of that stuff. That's pretty much what we, what we mentioned, I guess. EG really has that as its strong side, as uh, I've always said. They do manage to implement it quite well. Uh, anything to add, boys, or shall we? No, let's move yeah. on. I'm going to the next question. Okay, so once what again... Do you Feel most frustrating. Yeah, <laughs> let's first discuss that together, and I'll also, as we're discussing, skim through these things so that we get to, like a bit of a review, so we don't have to read all the same questions because there's gonna uh, uh, there's gonna be a hundred answers. So, and, and also just for context, we've just had the news of the new way that the reinforcement drops going to be released. And all of this stuff that you're reading does not take that into account, right? Because all of this came through before that came out. There might be a few things to add. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So uh, let's, let's start from BJ this time. So BJ, what do you find the most frustrating in this game? Um, I mean, it's, it's difficult because I, I try to... There's, there's kind of two things, isn't there? There's like, what do you you want personally as a as a gamer like and what do you enjoy about the game and 
And then I try to sort of step back and be more objective and say, well, just because, you know, BJ want, likes playing these games in this way doesn't mean actually that that's what the main kind of gamer base does. Um, most people aren't making content about the game. Most people are probably pulling out the mobile, playing the odd game, you know, one or two games at best a day. So I get that people want different things. I mean, I'd love to talk about like the, 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 the fact that I love the game so much, but there's no tournament scene, for example, that there's no incentive really around the ladder system. I hate that. You know, the, the, I, I keep going on about it, the pro ladder in Gwent, but I'd love to see something like that in, in this game. Um, I'd love to see, for example, in Legendary Division, the score that you post on ladder, rather than you just abusing the top deck, it is the aggregate of three your score across your best three factions, for example. So I've, you know, I've, I've got right. I've played my thirty Necron games this month, right? What am I going to do for my tower? Or what am I going to do for my elder? I think that that in itself, that mini mission that it creates, would would just send my height levels through the roof. Um, but I honestly, and I do, I, I am suffering from recency bias when I say this. I actually think that this news article that's come out tonight uh, really hits home for me what I do think my main frustration is. My main frustration is actually this. I understand that this game, you know, has a is from quite a small team, small development team. It's not, you know, it's not like Rune Terror where they had a bit much bigger backing of um, uh, what do you call them, Epic and all that sort of stuff. I think the the frustration is that I, I I know they can only do so much, and this game has so much potential. There's so many things they could do that would be so cool. We could all agree. And then the frustration is that you then see them spend and invest time on something that I just think, ah oh, man, really? We've got 101 things we could be doing. We can't do it all because we've got a small team, and that's the thing that we're prioritizing. That's that's my frustration. I don't I don't know that we're always landing on. I mean, for example, the Q1 roadmap. Bearing in mind, we're already in Q2 now, right? It says on there that we we're going to have alliance. Oops, I think you got oh, no, okay. lagged. Lost, BJ. <laughs> uh, BJ, are you there? Send the medic. I've got what are they called? Meds that have just been added. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're back. Yeah, back. So I'm just saying that the, the Q1 roadmap says we're going to have alliances, right? And we haven't got alliances, and we're now in Q2. But instead, what we've got is uh, yet another monetization. Is it medals or something that they're called now that's going to be added? So we've got another, yeah, so we've got another currency. And this new thing around how the releases work with this whole events thing and it's, it's not that i'm against the idea like i could see a lot of fun being had around the idea of having quests and stuff but it's like we haven't got alliances that's the thing that was in the roadmap that you put out there but now we've got this so i think that's my my frustration really is there's even a lack of kind of open dialogue with the community and a little bit of a, a um i don't know that the priorities are in the right way click Clearly, I could turn that around and say, "Look, if we were working for the company, clearly this is a move to say, how do we how do we maximise engagement? How do we maximise monetise our products?" And they're all correct things for a business to be thinking about, but that's just my frustration as a gamer, I guess. I absolutely understand you. Yeah. Uh, if it were my frustration, uh, mostly it's that game tends to get kind of stale. Uh, mm. like I have these moments when some a piece of new content drops, I play like crazy for one week, then I go play some other game for the next three weeks, and the final three days I try to climb to top 50 <laughs> to secure the card back. So, essentially, the problem that I mostly have is a lack of content. Um, mm. and mostly also, I guess that lack of content is also kind of tied to poor balancing. Like, the best uh time I've had in Warforge was, I believe, season three, was it? Where I remember I was fighting for top 10, and it was so cool, because I was playing Abaddon, then Papa was playing Uriel, then there was Shrigma playing Galen, and there was Balduco with uh, Emotech, there was Swarmlord, like, everything was there. 
and it was really fun because i i could play like three, 30 games and maybe oh yeah sure there were a lot of uriels but there were not too many uriels and today i played a game and it was like 15 on vase and four gordrangs and i was like okay man like what the heck right so and before that you suddenly have like only gas cool with the armor and it, well, it... Well, <laughs> do you know what was hilarious about what you just said ecclesia you just listed five meta decks and not one of them was orcs <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> but but it was it was Grook for reference. Grook was very strong that Grook season. Grook was but, yeah. yeah. Grook yeah. was also really good. Uh, and that that's the that's the thing. So that kind of sometimes gets uh, frustrating. So it would be really good to. But we'll talk about like balance and stuff more later on. And yeah. as for the new piece of content, as a Horse Heresy Legions player, uh, I was kind of disappointed with this update, and I'll say why. Because the raid itself in the draft is pretty good. Because I've been telling PJ for a while that sooner or later they would introduce new ways to play draft, which is necessary, absolutely. But I think they did it in a wrong way. Because uh, in HHL, usually when we had a raid, what it would have worked is there would be like a few milestones. One would be a card bag, then would be an avatar or something. And finally, there was a legendary card, usually a neutral one that everybody could use. For example, I remember, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, during the Skulls for the Skull Throne event, there was this card, Korn's Favor, that was basically proper killy but for everybody. And when you when we unlocked that on the raid, then so many new decks like came into play. Now, whether or not it was toxic, that's a different case, but it was good because even if we failed, you didn't feel like a faction was cheated, right? Right now, if uh, we all agree not to play, then that means that Chaos is going to receive less reinforcements than other factions, which doesn't make sense. I think the reinforcement should have come as a separate package, and they could have included something like an alt art or like neutral card or something else so that uh, we could like feel this feels like cheap kind of as if they know that we're gonna play and it's gonna happen anyway so might as well stick it in there i don't know uh beric what do you think and tim oh as far as this uh the new rake uh goes yeah the uh they probably should not have you know put on that that little extra pause about we're gonna remove stuff from the collection if it's not unlocked because i feel like you know the the goal of any game should be like fostering community engagement and you know player base uh, action. However, uh, you kind of should do that with like you know with like a carrot and not a stick, especially when it's a game. We're all here to have fun, right? So um, I do agree that like the I think for the most part this is looking like a a good a good action on their part because they're giving us free cards and they're giving us a community event. So that we can, you know, make collective progress towards. But yeah, I would say it's frustrating that it's been honestly, honestly not like communicated in the best way. Um, mm. I I don't think that the chaos players should be in any real worry because I'm sure like, I mean, there'll be everyone on the top fifty ladder, and and I know the <laughs> I know Klizirak, <laughs> you definitely want your chaos cards. So you'll probably grind in it, if not anyone else. But um, yeah, I feel like it's not not something to worry about in in effect, but. The, um, it does show perhaps there's a, a little bit out of touch with like how we want things to be communicated. Absolutely, Tim. Yeah, I I guess my response is kind of twofold for 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 what in what has been I guess most frustrating or one of the the larger frustrations for Warforge as a whole. I think for me has just been definitely feeling pretty limited by. Partially the the card pool, which is linked to content, definitely echoing a bit of what you were saying, Ecclesiarch, with um, just being able to have more variety in the meta, being able to have a healthier meta, um, having so many warlords that just really don't see the light of day at a reasonably competitive level. And I keep going back to that statement in every balance news article that's like, our intention is to you know like bring up the 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 things that are not as used right or like increase the uh efficacy of you know the warlords or the cards that are not seeing as much play and i i don't know if that's shifted in terms of their approach i i don't think so i think maybe there's just been a kind of a lighter touch as of late and i just really would advocate that 
we get a little bit more ambitious with bringing more things into the light because at the very least, you've got different variety for that month. So kind of at worst, if you buff something and that does kind of take over, so to speak, it's a thing that never took over before, right? So there, there's not a ton of risk, I think, for me of you know going a little bit bigger on buffs uh in in patches and i I think that's that's a big gripe for me on that front and then with with this news article in in particular and there's just like so much to try and wrap your head around that's part of the issue as well is just that it feels needlessly complicated very convoluted even trying to explain like the campaign and forge systems in the beginning was a little bit of a task because it's not terribly intuitive in some ways and this kind of thing, just like having it kind of bogged down by how long the article is, searching for this clause at the end that is kind of like, and also if you don't do it, you're not going to get three of these cards, um, you know, and, and trying to wrap your head around it. It's like, I don't think the average player is is going to be terribly enticed by this kind of presentation at the very least. Um, and I, And I really do agree with the sentiment of like, they might really be in a little bit of a different place of like what the average or avid player wants because we're all kind of having a similar reaction i think well i think we're kind of in unison about all of that as for uh the player replies i i could summarize it for you guys basically uh two two of the things that we have mentioned well minus the uh, chaos update right now because as i said as we've mentioned uh we close the survey before all of all that whole thing uh but mostly a it's the balance a lot of people are complaining without about balance and surprisingly enough they're not just moaning about the tau as i expected they're just saying that you know i we don't like it that there's always a meta warlord that completely smashes everybody else so i understand me, me and bj have like talked about this many times on the podcast that there should be a meta always there should be something that's stronger than the others but it should not be so strong as to just smash everything else right uh the second thing that they mentioned is of course the lack of content they've been saying that there's like uh, a lot of things missing and they it kind of gets boring because there's not enough variety. But the third one, which is actually interesting, is that a lot of them mentioned that the dailies are tedious. And mostly people mm -hmm. are saying that the problem with the dailies is that I, I've even had a couple of long comments saying that, you know, I come home and I just want to play like five games of my favorite faction. And suddenly I get dailies that tell me, okay, first do the shuriken, then do like dark pacts and then do reanimation, right? So most of them were asking to make it free to reroll the dailies so that they can at least, uh, you know, choose the quest that they want to do, I guess. Um, so there, there, there were like at least, I would say, 20% of the replies were about dailies as well. So, which I've never really thought about, to be honest. I've never really had much frustration with that, considering you can always complete it in um, practice. But I did... I do see the point when someone says, you know, I only got a little bit to play this game and then you force me to like divide it between five factions and I, I don't get to have fun. So I kind of get that. So uh, what's your take on that, guys, actually? Yeah, that's actually a really good uh, point, Ecclesiarch. The fact that some people have, you know, limited time, their their time in the game is, is you know, at a premium to themselves. And, you know, if, yeah, if, even sometimes I just I log on real quick for one or two games uh, in a day, and I don't like I don't want my bus piling up. And I also I just want to get like three more games on the rank ladder with with tower or whatever. I don't want to you know be putting dark packs on in practice. And so what I, I usually do is because I have crystals to spare or whatnot, I'll just re-roll the challenges until I get the soonest generic um, hmm. challenge, whether that be four hundred or two hundred crystals. You know, sometimes I'm only looking for four hundred points. Rather, if um, I'm trying if I was trying to complete a campaign, but I feel like there could be definitely some solution between like one free reroll for a generic quest each day, so that way like you can turn your ten shuriken into just like you know deal twenty damage attacking with your warlord. Everyone has that opportunity, or you can like try to do the hard challenge for the full four hundred points. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, gentlemen, now the next one is actually already statistics. 
and this one uh, is overall how satisfied are you with Warforge and this was a mandatory question so everybody answered and surprisingly enough if you take a look the highest is on seven with the second highest being on six uh, then there's also people saying eight there's seven people saying nine there's no tens but at no the same time person. there's only one person saying like one there's like five people on two there's like nine people on three four people on seven so overall people are people find the game quite all right so i i wouldn't say it's even all right it's on seven so BJ, yeah, you're seven. the expert on this, so what do you think? Well, I mean, the way I look at this is, so if you guys are familiar with like a net promoter score, which is something that's used in sort of customer service uh, fields, right? Basically, <clears throat> the idea there, the thinking there is, if you get an eight or more, then actually you're dealing, you're doing a pretty good job. Like your service is pretty good, your products are pretty good, your customers are pretty happy. Um, what this is saying to me is that like the fact that we we were predominantly probably hovering around the kind of six to seven mark as a majority, right? So what this says to me is that people like fundamentally kind of like satisfied with the with the fundamentals of the game. It kind of comes back to question one, all that good stuff that people like about the game. But but there are but 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 there are things that people are genuinely dissatisfied about. There are things that people would genuinely like um, or believe could improve uh, the service. So they've given up on it. It's not like it's a terrible product or a terrible service and I'm out of here, but it's like I'm playing, but I actually wish it could be, you know, 10% better. And I think it's a call to action because it's this within, you know, it's within the developer's um, thing. I, I do have sympathy though for EG and because I've played a lot of CCGs and I've seen similar things like communities will always moan about stuff. Um, and so, and sometimes with good, but it's a difficult thing to please. <laughs> you know, it's an ever-moving target. You're constantly releasing new content every time you do. I mean, pre-Tau, the game wasn't in a bad spot. The t the game was in one of the best spots in terms of the meta. You know, Uriel was top with only sixty percent. I think that's the first time we've ever had a meta where the number one deck is as low as sixty percent. I so think good. that's I think that's really healthy. And actually. If you remember, Gordrang just released um, about sort of three weeks before that. So people were just figuring out that the kind of like armor control or would stand up to Uriel. It was close, by the way. Sometimes Uriel would win and be be beat them down if they drew the nuts. And sometimes Gasgul could turn the corner. And for the first time in the game, you have this kind of classic aggro versus control thing. And, the, the you know, Galen was still good. It, you know, there, there was a really pretty even like zephyr blade i think had like a 52 percent win so we were seeing new decks new warlords performing pretty well i think i think you then release tau everyone got excited i love the tau i think it's a i think it's brilliant i think so many of the cards are playable but it is powerful and they are a bit up here at the minute and actually what it's done to the meta is completely kind of just smash that kind of balance and that's going to keep happening by the way you know <laughs> like and and if it doesn't like when the terror of Adagast expansion came out people will complain about that because you had an expansion where it was underpowered and it didn't really change very much and no one cared so it's very hard to like I, I don't envy their job of trying to please <laughs> a, a CCG community in an ever moving ever changing kind of environment absolutely absolutely so yeah i think you're spot on that bj uh that is absolutely what kind of we got there situation mm. so yeah let's uh let's move on the next is like what key changes would increase the score for you and there were some like cheeky answers like directly just buff the tyranids buff the necrons nerf the town <laughs> buff and the so tyranids. on but that. most people <laughs> <laughs> Most people were asking for three things, okay? So more content, more cards, the alliance system, and balance. So nothing new to say here. But there were also a couple of people saying that we want a tournament scene, which was also uh which is which is also an important thing. But I think we'll discuss the tournament and stuff like that a, toward, a bit towards the later parts. So uh as for the next part, this is very interesting. So Necrons actually came out as one of the least fun factions, according to the mm. community, because they have a whooping eight, almost 18% of the people saying that they're like one 
So they give him the lowest score, followed up by 30% giving it two, and only 2% saying that they're really fun. Yeah, and... Balduco. Yeah, that's that must be that must be Balduco and me. So basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's fifty percent. If you think about our one to five scoring system, and me and Barrick just recently did this with every Tau card, where we went through and did the one to five. Like one was unplayable, two was bad. This is saying like you know fifty percent of people think it's it's bad. It's not fun. You know, it's in the one to two range. Absolutely. And, it, and interestingly, what we haven't asked, but I would be interested to know. What would they have scored it like at the start of early access oh, before all the nerfs? Because <laughs> I think this is a faction that's been hit with a bloody sledgehammer like over the last five months. It just <laughs> next to Tyranids, they just constantly seem to get nerfed knocked. and nerfed. Yeah, nerfed and nerfed. Actually, Actually, before this, sorry, sorry, team, go on. Uh, oh, j just to say real quick, I think before the even the most recent Necron nerf to Scarabs and then some of their key cards like Lichgar. I know we got this later down in the thing, but. I think before that nerf, I would probably have set Necrons with an easy four in terms of fun to play, mm. and just that, like, and the the fact that they don't, they they really don't do much at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right because it kind of knocked the archetype, didn't it? And that, and that's the thing. I mean, we're probably stealing the fun of what makes it fun, and we'll come on to that. But they're not very flexible, right? There's not much you can do with Necrons. Uh, Perry, you know. what would what would you give the Necrons? Um, I think I put them. I think I should put them at a uh, three just because I really did like them. But I probably would have actually, personally, I would have probably given them a five before the nerf because that was like the first deck that actually made me want to like climb the rank ladder. Was that Emotech? I think it was probably very close to your Emotech control list a couple months ago. Yeah. But um, I mean, as soon as that nerf hit and the and the little changes in the winds of the meta that shifted even farther away from Necrons being good and the fact that they've dodged buffs for like the last two balance patches, I think that's kind of kind of criminal to. To their part, um, but yeah, I, I mean, they have a lot of potential as a faction. That's probably why I put them at a three because I see the potential. Kind of like what BJ was saying with the overall rating. It was like there's a lot of potential I see here. Just it's not yeah. quite there yet. Tim, yeah. what about you? What do you give the Necrons? I remember what I actually voted, but I, I think just taking in some of the the uh, comments here, I am not a Necron lover. I definitely would say. Like it's like a 1.5 if I'm trying to be as fair as possible for me. Um, I'm also not really a control player, and I think they've always had this kind of control bent to them. And so I think I'm not the best <laughs> player to ask. Uh, but I think when I was thinking about like what would make Necrons more fun would be just diversity in play style. Like why can't there be a frenzied, aggressive mm -hmm. build, right? Like mm -hmm. that, I want... If we're going to make three warlords that are supposed to have three kind of semi-unique identities or that hit on incentivizing these kind of micro synergies between certain cards in the card pool, then I want to see the viability of different play styles and not just one comp like monolith, you know, um, in, in this case. So that's, that's kind of where I see them. Love that idea. Yeah, I love that idea of making Frenzy the aggro theme within necrons because yeah. right now it's the most pointless I, I i don't think it's ever going to be playable right it's just there's worse than unstable <laughs> yes yeah, it's worse than exactly yeah <laughs> yeah it's really really bad and on top of that like i've been playing necrons ever since like alpha and there's the major problem that they usually had is that there were only two archetypes that always used a same set of cards like if you played emotech control there was like only one correct way to play it and then there was the oricon scarab which i don't even understand how people can play because this is the most stale deck that i've seen like uh, in in years <laughs> so yeah but so i totally understand the whole thing couple all of that with huge nerves and then you get this picture basically all right, what about the Eldar? If you take a look with the Eldar, actually, it's pretty good. So most people think that it's a 3 or 4, with 8% thinking it's a 5, and only 5% saying that it's not fun. Hmm, like, I kind of understand this, because Eldar are actually pretty fun, because all three Warlords, they play in a different style, despite uh, one, one, I mean, obviously being the strongest one, I still find Keltok fun to play. I find Zephyr Blade fun oh. to play. I think the only thing that kind of knocks down Eldar 
from for me from being five is that they also suffer from like the necrons of having like too many obviously good cards and having a lot of vanilla cards that are just not that good like cards that you know okay I, I, i'm gonna play eldar sure howling banshee okay where's the spirit seared and uh, yeah i know exactly what my eldar deck is supposed to look like right and that kind of kills it mm -hmm. but overall still pretty fun any different opinions on that guys yeah De Barry, didn't you didn't you have some um ideas for certain card changes oh, i, I, I mean, didn't know whether, it, where we bring that in ecclesia but maybe this is where that is that where you want to bring this in? Because I know Barrett's been working on some ideas for like some yeah. card changes and stuff. I think, I think bit... my... Sorry, go on, Barrick. Oh, no, 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 please. Yeah, I just wanted to say perhaps we could discuss the ideas on part two. Uh, okay. Just to, you know, just go through the uh, thing and just we could. About and then look at ideas for improvements. Okay, yeah, cool. I think that would be like uh, the better way to do it so that we don't like jump around too much, I guess. All right. Makes sense. Okay. Well, I, mean, I, I do think the faction is, um, with, without getting into any card ideas, I, I kind of agree with the uh, three and four. I mean, once again, I think before, I think this is also like maybe a, a post nerf uh, rating because I think the Eldar, the Hemlock, and Vengeful Wraith Blade were kind of considerable as well to the, the main Galen strategies, or even like, I mean, I think every deck is playing Hemlock and, and Vengeful Wraith Blade. Um, but. I think they were probably maybe even higher rated before that. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, they, they'd be the. I think if I could be on the balance team for any one faction, Eldar might be it because of like, I think they're really fun. I think they've got some, you know, the Spirit Stones reminds me of um, what was the Gwent faction that we've talked about before? Uh, the Syndicate. Syndicate, yeah, it reminds me of Syndicate where you can bank coins and then spend them to regain abilities and tempos later. I think they could do way more with stones. I think it's a, a brilliant system that's underdeveloped. I think there's a load of good cards, but there's a load of useless cards in the faction. And um, um, yeah, they're, they're definitely one I'd love to, um, I'd love to work on. Definitely. What about the Ultramarines? Where did they come? Ultramarines are uh, what you would expect. They're fairly balanced and generic. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, uh, but Middle. most people, it's actually a high percentage. 43% mm. of the people place them as, like, exactly mediocre in terms of that, while, like, 23 and 20 say a bit worse or a bit better. And actually, 10% do say that it's unfun, while 2% saying that it's very fun. Now, compare that to the Necrons, it's very surprising that. Uh, like uh, with the Necrons, there's also a high percentage saying one strongest sentiment on the yeah on the lower end, isn't there? But yeah. with Ultramarine, there's more to the higher end than to the lower end. So which is for interesting because they're not very powerful right now, right? Like no. and yet people find them fun, and I agree with that. Like I, I I think I put a four for Ultramarines. Like I actually like. I wish they were a bit more powerful because I actually just like playing them. You know, and I think the Warlord abilities, by the way, are very good. I think Ultramarines have some of the better warlord abilities so it really shows that the cards themselves are a little bit under underpowered at the minute but it's pretty fun like I'll, the codex thing's pretty fun and yeah i, I don't know i quite i quite like that i quite I, like them i think mostly the reason why they don't have a higher result is not that they're not fun is that they're weak right now and a mm. lot of people just don't enjoy getting their ass kicked which makes sense <laughs> so yeah. yeah that's the reason other than that i also think that ultramarines are pretty fun to play they're pretty generic but that's kind of what makes it fun to play to be honest because sometimes you don't want something complicated you just want something generic yeah black true. legion and take a look at this <laughs> so obviously they're very positive wow. And no I'm not surprise. surprised. And People I, love chaos, man. I don't get it. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I get I it. Chaos. I get it, man. I get it because, like, there is a couple of reasons. <laughs> a is that the aesthetic is pretty cool. It's like right amount of edgy, spiky boys, like all the demons and stuff like that. I know a lot of people kind of enjoy that. The aesthetic is a thing. And also, Black Legion, like, ever since they received their first batch of buffs, they have been pretty strong. And despite the fact that there's literally on, only one warlord that's really playable people still rate them pretty high and it's the most popular faction too i yeah. guess i i guess people just love the whole demon aesthetic i, I because i wouldn't say that black legion even though i love black legion 
I wouldn't say that they're like the most fun because they don't really have many different ways to play. There's like uh, kind of either actually it's more than let's say the Necrons. You can play the buggy version with uh, Black Crusade. There's the mid range Abaddon. There's the combo Abaddon. So like three or four decks you can make. I I guess I guess it's just their aesthetic as well as like the whole theme that makes them fun. I guess. Uh, yeah, just to cut in here, I something I keep thinking about, and you know, BJ was talking about this earlier with, you know, the the sort of like tug of war style, right? It's like you set up your board, you respond, or you're trying to be proactive or responsive, and it it feels like part of what I feel like I'm picking up here, but maybe this is me projecting, is just that play styles that tend to be a little bit more popular are ones that I think can both set the pace and answer the pace, mm. right? Whereas like Eldar can pivot, right? Or they can develop and, and there's sort of that, that going for them. Ultramarines kind of have a little bit of that. I think chaos have this ability to like potentially fully clear the board, but then also drop something that you, your opponent has to answer or else they're going to lose the game. And it, I, I feel like, that's to me that's what dynamic kind of gameplay is is that you have different options and you can kind of decide to drive the game or respond to the game or do both and i I, to me i feel like that's the biggest draw for chaos well people seem to agree (laughs) so that's pretty good next is the tau any predictions guys uh it's gonna be the it's gonna have a lot of ones and a lot of fives the haters and the lovers. You're correct. Oh, okay. You're correct. Yeah. This is the yeah. first faction that has the highest rating at five. It has 30% almost at five, while having another 26 at four, and has at the same time it has 14 at one. And I think this is not the people who find them unfun, it's the people who find playing against them. <laughs> Play against them. Unfun. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh Tau, and let me say, I'm not a Tau fan. I don't like the lore, I don't like the aesthetic. I freaking hate Tau in general, but I have to admit that this is the one of the best made factions in the game because they have so many units that are good that they have like almost no vanilla units. And that makes like playing them so fun because you can make like a gazillion types of decks. And that's kind of what we need with all of the factions. I think the devs actually nailed the Tau, apart from the fact that, well, sure, they're OP, but forgetting the balance issue in terms of like having good cards all across the board it tau is it so you guys are tau fans so what do you think mm-hmm. oh well i would have to say that yeah i i, I entirely agree and I, I think maybe we'll all kind of share the fact that this is just like a a really well a really interesting faction really well made just because, uh, yeah, I mean, we were saying like how be- between certain metas or even this meta, a lot of factions only have one or two viable play styles. Uh, there's there's like 13 different flavors of, of Tau you could even probably come up with right now. And variations upon like, you know, this little package, do I include it or whatnot? And it's all like good. It's not just like, oh, I have to just include this because it's the only way I have to AOE or whatever. It's, you know, do I want battle suits? Do I want devil fish? It's, there's... There's in so many options their their decks give you, all while being like good to try out. It's not like, oh, this one card is now inferior in this meta, I have to find its best replacement. Yeah, it's it's a lot more I think maybe pre pre nerf Eldar kind of felt like this a little bit. But even then there's a lot of dead cards in Eldar, but like yeah, as you were saying, how have so few if none no dead cards. And the variability, the variability is that is it literally like the, the deck building challenges that I think a lot of players are looking for. Absolutely, and well, it's symbolic that the orcs come after Tau, and look at that, orcs actually overall have a better result if you take a look, because there's only seven percent who think that they're one, while having still high percentage of five, four, and three. Uh, I think the orcs were the kings before the Tau in terms of variability. Because uh, BJ was always saying that what he loved about the orcs was how many ways you could actually build them, even Gaskell, for example. So, BJ, word to you. What do you think? I think I think orcs are still the best um, fac- uh, faction on on the scale, and the reason is is that I absolutely agree with everything Barrick said about Tau, and it it's a it's a positive sign, right, about 
the new releases that come. I'm excited for Kadia. I'm excited for what's coming. Because if, if Tower's anything to go by, I think they did such a good job. They made mechanics that matter. They made themes. You know, you can do do long range. You can do marker light builds. You can do, you know, you can go drone heavy. You can go suit heavy. It's all relevant and it's great. And it makes deck building fun. The thing that I think Orcs still have the edge over Tau on, though, is that um, if you just think more from the basis of like archetypes within a card game, I do think Tau are a little bit limited to uh, like a tempo play style. Um, whereas, you know, they can't make a deck like Gazgul Control, Fatigue Control. They can't make that that type of deck if they get too behind on board they have very few ways to come back they have long strike and they have like what the carry on tactics and fusillade Fusilade. combo and and then the only other real way of coming back would be if you played like a devil fish build and actually more later game try to combo off of that but that's not easy to pull off um Whereas orcs, you know, <laughs> we've got Will of Gork, we've got No Mucking About, and these are like foundational cards that are going to mean that orcs are always going to be viable. They're always, there's always going to be playstyles. Grook can can help us do wicked like tempo combos. Still, we can still that's still there. You know, if we want to switch, we can still do that. Your aggro deck, um, Ecclesia, that you made with Grook. Would still, you could still easily play that all season and get top twenty with them right now. In fact, right now that might be really good because there's so few um, aggro. So I just think orcs still have more flexibility than tau in terms of like the archetypes that you can build, um, and they also have a lot of like weird and wacky. They take the weird and wacky fun stuff, right? If you wanted to do an all unstable vehicle build in Orcs, you could. And do you know what? It'd be pretty okay. It wouldn't actually be a bad deck. You could actually build a decent deck, but it wouldn't be S tier, right? Like, and and you know, things would be blowing up. And they'd be blowing themselves up, and it'd be very Orky and very fun. So they just sort of like I don't know. The Orcs just sort of tick a lot of boxes for me. I would say Tau have probably a stronger squad, as in like every card is like. Probably probably edges orcs slightly in that in that department, but in terms of variety of archetypes, I think orcs are a little bit better. What, what do you guys think? Does that does that make any sense? Absolutely, <laughs> I agree completely. Yeah, orc is. I think you might have said this before, Beatrice, but orcs are really seem to be the faction of answers, and Tau is mm. the faction of threats. Like every card mm. or every combination of card and Tau is threatening. If you let them snowball, you know everyone's losing to storm of fire, but. Like orcs, they have the ability to answer every card or combination of cards in the game between, you know, all their board wipes, all their single target removal, all their very efficient flankers. And I mean, it's kind of it's nice to have those tools. And I, I mean, I've, I've played Gaz Control for a little bit, and I, I could see how that was like very, very appealing to people. And I think uh, that's just a, a stronger advocation than that we should have these efficient removals and flankers and answers like eventually to all factions in some way or another. Um, yeah. It shouldn't be that like orcs are the only ones who can somehow kill a stealth unit with no mucking about. Like everyone should have even like some maybe inefficient card combo, some semi reliable way to do that. And guys, don't forget once again, it's not, it's absolutely true, everything that was said. And also they're strong. Both of them are playable, and that also helps because people can win games with them. So both of them it's, it's, get that. It's it's also Barry. You made me think of something there where it, it's like it's what you don't want to do is you don't want to give will of God to every you know every faction because then everything just becomes vanilla. But if you think about it, Tomb World in Necrons, it's kind of like their will of God. What I mean is, Tomb World enables. Necrons to play a control build, it's the reverse of Will of God. It's like you clear my board, I'm bring all my board back. It's the graveyard idea. It's it's a real clever. It's a great card. It was my first legendary I actually crafted, and ne Necrons was my first um, premium campaign I did, and it it's that's what I'm looking for. It's it's that kind of like design that's real to the the IP of the of the race, the faction, but enables mechanics like. I'm actually the one thing I'm disappointed with uh, with Tower a little bit, or at least I was at first, was that there wasn't like a long control deck. Mm. But now I'm realizing, and the main deck I'm climbing with is is a is a is a 
um, a Tau deck that, that actually does, that actually can play the late game very strong, but it does it more through value and tempo rather than like control mechanics, if that makes sense. So, yeah, that's why I just want to see. I just want, I think, I'll tell you what I think. I think every faction should be able to play an aggro deck, a mid range deck, a control deck, and Absolutely. a combo deck. And that yeah. would be awesome. That would be really cool. That would be the golden age. Mm. Absolutely. And speaking of combo decks, we got the Nids. Nids did better than I expected. Oh, gotcha. uh, they still have like a lot of negativity here. So thirty, mm. about thirty-four uh, percent of the votes think that it's more bad than good, while thirty-one thinks that it's more good than bad, while thirty-two being in the middle. I think mostly what makes Tyranids go to the shorter end is that they are very stale, except the Neurotroph. Because, uh, well, Var Vardengast, I'm not sure, maybe people are still working on it, but I'm picking it up, but Swarmlord is kind of, has always been the same. Wait for the Ravenous Hunger and just destroy your opponent. Tervagon, when it finally became pay playable, it was okay, just uh, use your Overwhelming Swarm and just drop, like, insane amount of units, and then it got nerfed. Neurothrope was always the interesting one for me, especially after the ad addition of the um norn emissaries and stuff like yeah. you can play pure control with that and, and stuff like that but overall the problem with the nids i think is that they've they they're over reliant on ravenous hunter a lot of times i think they're i think the norn emissaries kind of made a control build a little more viable there have been some suggestions on how to make tyranids more interesting and we'll get to that when we discuss the things on the second part overall i kind of get this because people find it fun but not fun enough because perhaps the whole combo thing might get boring over time because you're doing the same thing you get ravenous hunter okay i win if i don't get it okay i don't win right which i think was good that eg nerfed the ravenous hunter but they should have also provided some buffs in <laughs> as compensation but well there's, more a, on there's, that a, later, there's, yeah. there's just a couple of things on the nids uh Ecclesi i think I actually think they might be the one faction where they haven't quite nailed the IP correctly. Like, I, mm. I don't feel like Swarm, for example, um, actually nails, like, what Swarm in Tyranids is, or at least in my head. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't... I, I'm not sure they have. I also think they're forced into certain play styles which are very heavily punished, you know? <laughs> and that's yeah. only going to get worse with this chaos. This new chaos reinforcement, I think, is going to just really yeah. punish um, Tyranids. I'm not it's sure gonna what it's going to be scary. <laughs> well, we'll see, but it's going to be very, very scary for sure. Mm. Okay, you know, what makes a faction to play? Overall, there's like a ton of answers, but let's read like 10 diversity, variety, potential to make plays and have like. Uh, things that we get their kit, possibility to build different decks of variety once again, the mm. ability to adapt and overcome against most play styles and stand a chance, useful cards, card synergy and overall theme, interesting abilities, variety, faction mechanics, diversity, uh, mm. happy, not happy, sorry, fun combinations, combinations, versatility, flexibility. So most people are saying that the variety as well as interesting combinations are what makes a faction fun guys by the way for those of you who are watching don't feel as if like we're skipping over this stuff this is all going to be sent to eg and i have like i i have shared with the guys and i've read all of these answers so don't think that any, anything's going to be ignored just for the <laughs> not not to make forecast like five hours long we're not going to read everything but yeah mostly people are saying that it's variety as well as interesting combos and mechanics that makes a faction fun which I think perfectly coincides with what we've been speaking about uh, in terms of uh, the answers in the previous one. Mm. So yeah, I think I think it that's like a good question. That's that's there. good data. That that what makes it fun. It's good data. They they I hope they they take something useful away. And it, it looks like there's quite a consistent theme there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like even if we scroll down, look at this versatility. Uh, strategic decisions. Uh, look at this. Characters like Tau, many decks to build that feel viable. Multiple different ways. So it's the same thing. Everybody's saying mm. the same thing, right? Mm. So there you go. 
So, for example, a guy saying Eldar collecting souls using them to overhaul you is really fun. So, everybody, like, finds those things really fun. And look at this. Ultramarines. I started with this faction, became very bored of it quickly. It's all about reaching the opponent with the answer to the problem they proposed. If you have the answer, you win. If you don't, you lose. I feel like I could uh, automate this playstyle with a script. Codex is fun, but it's the only option they get. So, there's, like, uh, there's, like, many different types of answers that we're getting here, but... Oh, this guy, this is one whole comment. Let's read the overall. Uh -huh. Faction fantasies and their mechanics are great, but some factions feel cornered into forced play styles. Yeah, there mm -hmm. you go. So basically it's the same thing. Once again, <laughs> look at this. If I can win. <laughs> that's, a, that's an honest answer. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I think the picture is the same, guys. Overall, people are, people are asking to be able to play many different play styles. So, yeah. Let's skip the so, animation. <laughs> You're going to get shot. Yeah. I think well, the speed of this animation. uh, animations, I'm going to be shot for sure for this. But the question yeah, let's is... Just, let's just speed them up when you get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, guys, uh, one thing I need to tell you so that you don't freak out, why there are so many answers. When I added the Russian translations, it actually pre created a separate answer sheet for them. So we'll just yeah. combine. So the question was like, do you think the animations of the game need to be sped up? So... 31% thinks that eventually, so where's the other eventually? Six, right? So about 37% think that eventually it should be sped up. Uh, let's see. About 36% think that it's fine. Yeah, while, so it's not, mm, it's not while, high priority then. Yeah, while like... In total, if you would if you would add these answers and this, you would see that like about thirty six percent think that they're fine, but the rest, the rest like um, sixty four, think that it should eventually or as soon as possible be sped up. So most players, about sixty percent, think that they need to be sped up. And the, the only the only, the the one thing I wonder about this in terms of relevance, Ecclesia, is how many HHL players find this frustrating right because obviously that'd be the natural market for warp forge people who played the previous eg game coming over and i know that hhl feels a lot faster it's the, the animations are much more sped up so i do wonder i did wonder whether those players find warp forge quite frustrating by comparison what i've Think heard like that? mostly what i've heard uh, from hhl players they do say that the animations are really slow one was the tyrannid thing that they fixed the other is for example like reanimation with the necrons jesus it takes so long mostly what people are complaining you know what they're mostly complaining about in terms of animations it's not their ranked games it's the draft because they're saying my draft takes three hours because like mm. the, the animations are slow slow and you might think what the hell are you talking about but if you think about it if because of the animations you take two extra minutes to play a draft game then 12 games is 24 extra minutes right and that already adds up so I think by animations, some people might have not understood what, what was meant here. What is meant is that like the small animations, like for example, the plasmaster plasmancer shot, the reanimation, the explosion. So it usually takes unnecessarily long and those things add up and then it also makes draft tedious. So I think it makes sense that most people want it to be sped up to a point. They did a perfect job with the Tyranids when they sped up the whole uh, buff animations with them because it was crazy. What do you boys say? Uh, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, shaving off time on some particularly slow, like not every animation needs to be sped up. And I think maybe some people might have read this and been like, oh, we don't just want a 2x speed filter applied to everything in the game. Of course not. No, they should go through this you know, with a careful eye and, and look at the... I'm sure they probably have some metric where they can order each card's animation by longest time or things that have multiple animations. For like, one I see all, all the time now is is the bomb squig, right? It's mm -hmm. got to blow up my board and then it's going to blow up its board and then it's got to go somewhere and then it's got to do something else. I don't know. Or like, no, because then the Makari has to go back to their hands. So that's like three things for like one guy dying. That's absurd. Oh, yeah. That should yeah. that should be happening simultaneously. Or the Storm Boy Strike is another orc card. They place each one down one at a time. No, just they should all come in at once. The Storm Boys are striking together. Um, yeah. So it's, it's really those things that can, or like the Eldar Souls, like the Eldritch Storm, when you, you do the second storm, just have it happen twice as long or something. Well, like not twice as long, but like have it be a more intense one storm there than having to do two separate ones or something. Yeah, like there's there's a lot of there's a lot of good yeah, ways they can crazy. shave off some important time um, that will really just benefit everyone. 
not not so much as making the animations less impactful. Or, I mean, a lot of people have said that's what they like about the game is the immersion, the the sounds and, and the shots. It's not getting rid of that or making it less impactful. It's just there's some problems here that can be mitigated. Yeah, absolutely. There used to be this card called the Host of Lupercal or Master for Lupercal that would drop like six Astartes or something on the board, like the Stormboy Strike. And it was just one animation and they almost simultaneously dropped like... It was like, so it was pretty quick. So I think that's what they need to do, not like individual with the orcs, you know, it's like pretty crazy. So yeah, I agree. There are some tedious animations, small ones that like you could really fix so that it doesn't really end up adding up. Mm. Yeah. The next one is, what do you think is the bigger priority for the game? Now, this one had other as an option, so we're going to check that. But the highest point, 33, is balance. Let me actually check the other one. So, 6 and 33. So, there's like 39% of people who think it's balance. I'm uh, surprised about that. That's really interesting. But look at this. 15% uh, is adding more content like game modes. Let me check that. Uh, yeah, so that means 16% need to think that alliances and stuff need to be added, and adding more cards is about 33%. So the most of the people say it's balance, but at the same time, if you add these two up, because they're kind of similar to each other, you would get like 50-ish percent saying we want like lodges and stuff like that. There's also some different answers saying uh, filling out the roster for some factions, uh more content and the alliances all of the above attracting more players incentivize play so yeah mostly i think here it's like evenly divided between somewhat even between balance and more content i would think that it's going to be more content but i think a lot of people are also frustrated by the balance so yeah there's that's the picture tim what's your take on this yeah, th this actually doesn't surprise me. I, I think just because, although I think there are always a lot of calls for like, let's get more cards, let's get more characters, let's get more, you know, just more, more, more. Um, it doesn't feel great when you get more and then you're like, okay, well, everyone has to play Tau now, right? Like that, just because there's new content there, you know, doesn't doesn't make the actual playing of the game that much more enjoyable. So I, I could definitely see that um, especially for people who have really stuck with the game and have seen the different phases of like, well, we did have metas that were very balanced, or we did have, you know, metas that were that were just a, a, a bit more variety, um, you know, and then you get stuck in certain metas where that's not the case, you feel it really, really quickly. I can't play the deck that I played all last season, right? I can't do, you know, Uriel in the way that I wanted to, or, or X, Y, or Z. So I do think that balance becomes very apparent very quickly, whereas content can feel really great as a sort of a short-term solution, right? But long-term, I don't know that that's necessarily the the quote priority. So at least for me, I read this and I'm like, yeah, this this sort of is my experience with the game, and um, and I, I think that this is a is really really helpful feedback. You're you're getting as clear a picture as you can of like what's going to be the thing that keeps me or gets me in or, you know, just allows me to really, uh, you know, enjoy this game and, and put my time and effort into it. Yeah. Well, this means that EG has their work cut out for them because people are demanding both. <laughs> so, yes. Very well. So take a look at this, guys. So do you have any of the, do you think that any of these nerfs need to be reverted? And look at this. So Uriel's extra card. 38% plus 8%. So 46% of the 100 people, so about half of the people there think that the Uriel extra card needs to come back. Uh, about, so 33 plus 9, about 40% as well think that Lich card HP needs to come back. Uh, we also have about 40% that think that the hex mark um nerf needs to be reverted and should hit the full board and a little bit lower on the angels of death about 32 percent think that the agents of death nerf should be reverted now so just just to clarify first on this ecclesia then so when you say 40 percent think lich guard should go back up to six does that mean 60 percent don't think that then? 
Is that how we... I can't remember how we... Can't. Yeah, it means that the others just didn't mark it. Which kind of means they don't think it should, right? Yeah, most people seem to think mm. that... Like, the majority don't seem to like that the nerfs... Don't think that the nerfs are, like, bad. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of answers saying, I don't know when I'm indifferent. Uh, yeah, I might add that, like, I feel like a good number of people who play... Even who play a lot on a couple of factions, you know, they might not play... Eldar or Necrons, and so when they see do these nerfs need to be reverted, well, maybe they don't really care if Lich Card has one less HP when they're to fight it anymore. It's they're kind of indifferent to it, but they're not going to mark it on the response, perhaps. Yeah, I, I would say it's even interesting that we got at least forty something percent on these. So we know that almost half of the players do think that it needs to go go back. So probably it's something that that's worth experimenting on from EG side, I guess. Uh because there's a once again there's a lot of answers that's uh, no, but there's other people asking for example like chron chronomancer Chronomance. enough. There's actually a lot of people mentioning chronomancer like chronomancer. I don't understand the chronomancer nerf. Like some people are saying that the hemlock needs to come back. That's probably the most passionate one actually, isn't it? We probably should have added yeah. that one. Yeah, mm. a lot of people are saying chronomancer, mm. which makes a lot. Of sense. I think most people said that the chronomancer nerf was stupid. <laughs> And I can't. I I don't even get why they did that. Like she thought it was a chronomancer buff. That's what they were thinking. Uh, well, congratulations, because it's not. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. They, maybe they thought it was a buff. Well, they know. wanted it to work with the reanimation. It, the the fact that the way it was worded previously didn't work with the reanimation. That's Necron's thing. They're like, oh well, we want this ability. This guy, this guy's ability to work with the faction's ability, right? When it really should have just been Orc Knob or better Orc Knob all along, because Orc Knob would give reanimated things flank just as well Absolutely. as it from your hand. And there's also an answer saying Harkin should fly, and uh, there was an int there was a funny one here. Wait. Nothing, nothing. No chaos buffs? No wonder they are weak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm I surprised. Like the... Yeah, go on, go I on, just, Tim. I just like at the bottom, no, Lamau. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, some people think that these are good. I would say uh, the problem with the taking away Uriel's extra card is they kind of destroyed one very good play style that they created and was a really good move because Uriel Aggro would add only 60% and it would not be as strong right now and Lich Guard nerf was too much man like I can understand the attack nerf on Lich Guard but HP as well like it's not even doing its role now what like what are you gonna do drop a Lich Guard to the tower just gonna execute for free because it has zero ranged attack and the health is just killing it so uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the Lich Guard you know, we've already said ne Necrons don't have much flexibility, and you just killed like one of the major cornerstones of the control deck. Yeah. Especially when you add that then with the, not so much the two world nerf, but the, certainly like the hex destroyer and things like that. And then the Uriel one, just that's the one just, just was so needless because, first of all, it was the meta deck, but it was in the meta deck in the season that only got 60%. Um, also, that 60%. That season, they got like something like I don't know a week or ten days of that season pre Gordrang, so it wasn't going up against armor and control. Yeah. So, so that actual sixty percent was probably lower if you just took into account when Gordrang entered. So it was trending down basically. So there was no need to destroy a, an archetype, and it has it has destroyed it. Like it really has. Like the the you know that the the. You nailed it, Ecclesiac. When you said, like straight away, you said the fact that it gets and gives them an extra card is going to make um, uh, is going to mean that you want to try and use all your cards, and therefore it's going to bring in a more consistent aggro deck. And you totally nailed it. And I've, I've tried Uriel this season, and it feels way. It's obviously if you still if everything lines up, it's still powerful, but it's way less consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, obviously. yeah, 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 definitely. This one is the one that I was very interested in. What do you think should be done about the weaker warlords? And like uh, 7 plus 40, so about 48% think that they should give him a special card, like in HHL. Uh, so a one-time use of special card. Um, mm -hmm. Then there's 15% who think that, uh, wait, 15% and wait, 
it's three. So there's about 19% who say that they should just buff the talent. For example, maybe the talent should cost less or the talent should do something else. Then there's nine plus three. So there's around 12 to 13% saying that the HP or damage stats of the warlord should be buffed so majority uh, think that they should get an extra card while the second majority says they just buff the talent there's also some different uh, answers like design them with a different play style give them passive abilities that give their ch chances to play a different play style with offense cards and so on battle talent add options for multiple talents to be used to cover weaknesses such as on vast talent a special card or reintroduce entirely did not play enough to respond a mix of the above give them better freaking ability and special card in addition maybe to start uh to a starting hand well special card just to clarify guys in hhl it starts as an extra card uh change their abilities to allow them to allow different play styles the game is fairly new and the card pool isn't decided i think making overall card pool more dynamic would be would see them mm, to have better place in the meta mm. let's take a look Passive abilities, no idea. <laughs> it depends on the Warlord. Adding passive abilities, none. I think keeping Warlord abilities as unique as possible. The weaker cards will find new synergies. I like Faction Fantasy and synergies. And uh, take Boss Zaxrook. Maybe he triggers mob twice and he attacks, making him a good mob boss. Grook could draw a vehicle instead of a card. So most people are asking for synergies. If you take a look, change their talent, I would say adding HP and giving it a special card. So most people are saying that either they should give them a special card or give them a passive so that they have an identity. The whole idea of those special cards in HHL was exactly that. Like, I always like to bring up, for example, Corswain, who used to have like Duelist Triumph. It was a two energy card, one time use. And when Corswain would use it, he would gain two attack for that turn, as well as first strike, which was basically sniper. And that kind of solidified him as a aggro warlord because he could either use that as a finisher or use that to like keep the board in his favor without trading his units so that he could push aggro. And on the other hand, for example, then you had, let's say, Ariman who could steal the enemy's card and make it cheaper. So there were a lot of interesting things that kind of gave those warlords an identity. So I, for one, don't see why they could not use something like that in this game. Oh, I think it could be better than the flat bonuses because when they give flat bonuses, it usually goes crazy. Like, as an example, they reduced Turbigon's cost to zero. Suddenly, it became, like, extremely powerful. They gave two Grots to Gaz. Suddenly, it became extremely powerful. So, now they nerfed, like, the ranged attack and suddenly it's not that powerful. So, I think playing around with X special cards could be a little more reliable. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I I'm there are so many important things in this survey, but this really hits on something that's really important to me, which is what is going to make a lot of you know warlord or a lot of identities in this game actually more competitive or or really like show up so that it can feel like oh I'm gonna not just play against Uriel with Space Marines, I'm gonna play against you know, also Tigurius, right? I'm not going to just play against Swarm Lord. I'm going to see, you know, some Neurothrope or blah, blah, blah. I think that that's super important. And and here there's a lot of information that's just like, what would what would the community like that approach to look like? And and that is a lot of data to sift through and, and kind of reimagine. And I, I think, you know, Ecclesiarchy set up some really, really great options to kind of get the ball rolling. And and I love that there there was the open response to, I feel like this is such a great place to draw influence from for EG and really say like, okay, if our intention and goal is to bring other things that are less powerful, and in this in this question with warlords, which is really important because that's that's an identity, that's a play style, that's a niche, right? Which is something that other people mentioned throughout this, then like we really should take a look at this because I think it's clear from everything that if the positives are niche and identity and flexibility and, and, and variability, then this is this is, ties into that very directly. And, it, and if you can really actually uplift some of these warlords and you can really enable their identity, then I feel like it, it really is going to improve so much of, you know, what's what makes the game, you know, fun and positive for so many people. Yeah, absolutely.
absolutely. I definitely love to see some love for the um, non or DHP warlords as well. But yeah, there's a lot of interesting things that they could introduce. Like I remember one one more point to add before we move on. Like in HHL, mostly uh, we also had 30 HP warlords instead of 35, 30, 35, and 40. And I've mentioned this a couple of times that the Primarchs who had 40 HP also had a special card called Reckoning. But this Reckoning was different. It didn't start as a special card in your hand. It started as a card, which meant you were playing essentially with two cards, not three, at the start. Because those Reckonings were like 20 cost cards that you had to like meet specific, uh, kind of like the Norn Emissary kind. You need to have met specific conditions to use. So the problem was that they started with less cards. And it's a big deal. But they had 40 HP to compensate. While the lower HP Warlords would start with more cards, naturally, and they would also get a special card. Like uh, the thing, right? For example, with Horse Wayne. So yeah, there's a lot of things to uh, do that. Because currently, it sometimes feels like a Warlord having 5 more HP just decides it. Because it's more durable. For example, Harkon and Abaddon is a very clear example on that. Next is also interesting. Do you think that we need the initiative system in the game like HHL? 36 uh, plus 10. So 46% think that the initiative is going to be a good idea. While about 37%, 38% think that it's not a good idea. And then we have different answers as well. Don't know. I don't know. Never played HHL. I don't know. No. Uh, being able to set preference to going last for defensive card and having board for my factions. Uh, I strongly dislike the work board and music. Okay. No. I don't know. I'm not sure. While initiative could be interesting, I think that first we need to look at balancing of the offense and defense cards because a high initiative mm -hmm. aggro deck can have matchups tilted extremely in their favor because of that. Yes, but honestly, uh, the defensive offensive cards need to be removed first. I need, uh, I make, it makes no difference. Can't say, I don't understand anything about this. You need to be clear, <laughs> okay? I think a lot of people will put yes to this, but a lot of factions like to go second. I run Iliac mm -hmm. primarily. I we said and so we on. said some of this might happen, Ecclesia, when we reviewed this question because it's very much a HHL question. Like if you didn't play it, it's hard to understand. And also, if you did play HHL, you might be more biased towards it. But in HHL, they don't have offense cards, so yeah, there a... was only defense cards. Exactly. So there is this kind of like in, I, mm, I don't I don't know ultimately how useful this question is going to be, but I mean it's certainly interesting to see that. It is almost like a half, 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 almost half, half split, a bit like a Brexit poll. Um, but yeah, <laughs> sensitive subject. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I don't know how useful it will be because of that, you know, because of the context there. Yeah, honestly, the main reason I would like that added in the game is I think it kind of helps with Warlord balance because I just remember... I've told you this example. There was this time when they buffed Night Lords and they buffed the Space Wolves and Tigor and Sevatar were stupidly overpowered. Both were playing aggro. Both had high initiative. And what they did was instead of gutting the faction, they reduced their initiative to medium and they became more manageable when that happened. So I think in a way it does help you play around because sometimes increasing or decreasing the initiative on a Warlord can really help. Same with mm. there was with Thousand Suns, Fosest Car with low initiative. And when they increased it to medium initiative, it was all right. And sometimes, like, you know, th there was this interesting one. There were some warlords that had start with one extra energy, but they always had, like, very low initiative, so, or low initiative, so that they didn't go first most of the times and didn't have, like, too much excess amount of energy. So, you know. Interesting stuff, but there's definitely half half divided. So in this game, in this game, you'd have to make. So in this game, you'd have to make Tau have the highest initiative, so that they always go first because it's better to go second than get your <laughs> defense card. <laughs> so it's, it'd be like almost like counter initiative. We need counter intuitive. Uh, um, that's actually the like... weird part, you know. In HHL, despite <laughs> yeah. having defense cards, despite having the defense cards, most people would still favor going first. Because yeah, of having but, initiative, while well, we Warforge is not the same, yeah. Yeah, so that's another complication to this one, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and I, I do. Is... Oh, go ahead, Bear. I was just saying that in Warforge, it seems that it's like very faction specific whether or not you do or do not want to go first. Um, 
kind of just because it like I guess I don't know how the defense cards were in HHL necessarily, but it seems like some defense cards are way better quality than other factions you have know, access to, like a two energy cheat for a unit versus a, oh, a yeah. pathetic drone. Yeah, two. Like, there is some that might be like an uh, it might be like a a balance or like an internal balancing between factions, but it also sometimes makes like the the flexibility of choice not that great. Like maybe your deck doesn't want a free drone, or maybe your deck doesn't want you know doesn't want to have this random ping right and that's why i kind of like the ultramarines is just kind of almost like a coin like a free energy mm -hmm. that's very it works with a lot of different things even though ultramarines kind of do only one thing i feel like maybe a generic uh ver more versatile defense card that everyone has access to like one energy would um would make the going first and second thing less of a less of an issue because i never I mean, it was certainly noticeable in Hearthstone, but I, I feel I noticed going first and second like much more in, in match outcomes in in Warforge than I have in any other card game. Yeah, what did they have? The coin or the ring in Hearthstone? It was the coin. Yeah, it was it just was one free coin, energy yeah. for like a yeah. little tempo boost for going second, and kind of you also got the extra card, and that was mm. just like perfect for every deck. Like every deck, um, some yeah. decks you did want an extra energy your first turn, like Ramp Druid to play your Ramp spell a turn early because that's always great, but. Mm. Other decks, it was just like that little boost you had, you needed to make going second not feel so terrible. But in Warp Forge, if you're going second, that means you're always contending. Um, you have to answer their five energy threat with your five energy. You whereas they will get six energy to answer your five energy. Mm. You're always at that disadvantage, and in, in this much more tempo based match, at least at the moment, or game, at least at the moment. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Tim, were you going to add something? Uh, yeah, I, I have not played a lot of hhl but i i was semi you know familiar with the the concept and to you know to the point of like feeling like we've got a little bit of apples a little bit of oranges between the two games i i i think the point about what ecclesiarch was saying that stuck out to me was like initiative is almost like a slider that could be adjusted depending on how the meta is shaping and mm. i i think that there is a benefit to homogenizing things for trying to address like gaps in the power level mm. and and that that is a delicate balance i think what i love about warp forge is that they kind of shoot for this like everything has its own kind of identity and we've got like very specific um for the most part offense cards defense cards even though even if they share certain concepts so i i love the specificity but it does feel like there might be some extra kind of balancing mechanism that would make this a little bit simpler and a little bit easier. Um, so if, if it wouldn't be initiative, I think kind of borrowing that idea of like what could knock like any deck down a notch or up a notch and what, what could that look like? Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Surprisingly enough, guys, I thought that there would be much different answers on this one, but Overtime, what do you make? Uh, what changes would you make to the overtime? And 52% of around says that it's fine as it is. So most people like the overtime and don't think that it should change. 9% um, said that the extra card draw should activate later, uh, other than 10, so not so soon. 6% or 7% think that it should not give you extra draw. And 7% also think they should give a one-time bonus. So mostly, and some people think they should not give extra energy, but most people think that it's fine as it is and doesn't need a change. So, yeah. Mm. Mm, interesting. That was surprising to me because I felt like there was a ton of chatter like during early days that over time was like terrible. But I, I guess maybe we've <laughs> we've gotten used to it. I don't know. I suppose you could look at that data and say half the people think it should change. It's just they disagree on how, right? Like uh, half, you know, see what I mean? It's like half are saying keep it the same, but actually half of the people are, are, are recommending a change. It's just they don't you agree on what that change is. So yeah. I guess the safe thing for EG is to keep it the same for now. <laughs> for now, probably, because, like, you know. 
but uh, this is also, my favorite I... answer though sorry very just this one is my favorite i still oh. don't understand anything you're talking about what overtime for me the <laughs> time when you have to play it's clearly too long player taking too long should be penalized okay so Beric. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, you yeah, know, I think that the overtime mechanic is is interesting to this game. I haven't seen it before in, in like any other games I've car, online card games I've played. But like, I think a lot of people like it, or at least are okay with staying it, keeping it right now because it's kind of like the decks and the playstyles are all built around it being inherent to the game. Like, we don't have a lot of card draw, and we don't really need it because by the time we run out of our cards, we're gonna draw two cards again. Um, and so I feel like if, you know, get, if, if factions were given decent card draw tools and like resource management became more important and we were to mess with the overtime rules and that would maybe create a more interesting change in play versus just like some decks running out of steam much earlier than others. Um, and some like right now relying on overtime, losing that, I think there would have to be a little bit of balancing within the tools that the factions have compensate for losing the you know, the resource advantage of of dragging the game out. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And fortunately guys, here's the one that unanimously almost everybody agrees is a good idea. Do you think that there should be a testing environment where players have a blah 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 blah? So the beta testing environment as we said. Take a look at this. So 64% plus uh, 14. So 79 to 80% of people agree that there should be this, while there's like only 20% of people saying that there should not. So 80% of the responses are that this is a necessary change. And I absolutely agree. This is what we need the most because this would make this would make life easier for Evergild. Like, imagine, let's say they're sending out some patches, right? And two weeks early, they make it available to whoever. And after some testing, they give them feedback. And during the patch, patch day, you already have a pretty good idea of what you're doing. And people are not complaining. You don't have to listen to last moment rants and saying, oh my God, look at what EG did. And you don't have to listen to content creators doing panic videos on stop don't do this and so on like it's uh... oh that's my favorite <laughs> <laughs> i think this is a very very necessary change and before we start discussing the next question is kind of tied to it so who should have the access so um 50, 33 so only some top players uh let's see let's see only some top yeah so 41 percent say that this should be top players and content creators while um uh, about 28 percent say that it should be everybody but every guild should revoke the access if they are being hateful and not giving constructive feedback which kind of makes sense to me uh seven percent think that it should be just everybody i think yeah, nine percent think that it should be everybody, and uh, there was eighty percent just said I answered no to the previous question. So most people think that only top create content creators and top players should have it, like not top content creators but content creators and top players. While another majority think that it should be accessible to everybody, but if every guild should keep under control if they're not constructive, they should just revoke the access. So boys, I'm listening. I mean, this is a fantastic suggestion. I would be uh, excited to, you know, just know that they're opening up another, like, kind of, uh, not not mainstream avenue, but they're they're that they're adding to the core of, you know, their games balance and patch cycle, like direct community engagement. That would be a fantastic step for any game, but especially this one, since the community does seem to be quite vocal on balance and the changes that they do post. This, like, yeah, you're you're exactly right, Clazer. This, like helps eg cover themselves on the community appeasement front and also is like improving the product that they do patch and release and and it gives like you know the content creators and top players like an extra way to for them to contribute and um interact with the, the game that they obviously enjoy playing so i think this would be a fantastic change all around um the real thing is just like can can there be enough push at at eg to to get something like this situated yeah um as for like just to quickly tell you we're not going to go through all the extra comments for the same reasons as like the previous ones but 
mostly in the extra comments it was keep up the good work guys like mostly directed to the cc and they said that please make this reach our guild's ears so a lot of people were very like excited to have Evergild actually read this because they were saying a lot of them were saying this is like a perfect chance for Evergild to have yeah. communication with the community and I totally understand guys like uh, it's hard to listen to people just saying uh, crazy bullshit at the same time because when uh, he, when somebody just jumps out and says oh my god you degenerates and you're doing this it's a, like of course you're not going to take into consideration what they're saying right so mm -hmm. and when you know that on the main court that happens a lot I understand why there could be a problem but this still does not let me say this still does not justify the fact that there's no almost no communication I think that they need a community manager like desperately but until they get that straight well we're here to here to help all they have to do is take it that's what that's what i'm gonna say about that i think i think the, the other thing to be fair tg as well is like i mean look that last question that you just posted about the testing environment i've played in many, many ccg games where they did it i i voted on there to say yes i'd like it because as a player i would but i know it's never going to happen like practically speaking it's just a nightmare it's an absolute nightmare I mean, you think about how tight it already is, right? Like, if you think about from a project management, like how tight their thing is. They released Towel three weeks ago, guys. They're already turning marketing thing around for for um, for chaos. You you've got to create a separate server. You've got to get your guys to play. You've got to give them a certain amount of time. You've then got to have feedback mechanisms to get that feedback. You've then got to synthesize and make sense of that data because, you know, Tim's got an opinion and BJ's got an opinion. And how do we, you know, you've got to have enough people to be able to find like a, a, a kind of synthesis of the, what that feedback is. You've then got to have more development time to make the changes to what you were going to release because actually it was found to be OP in the testing. Oh, and that's all got to be lined up with, obviously, your comms and your marketing and your release schedules. Even big companies really struggle with that. And um, I, I just think, I think the reality of it is going to be now on impossible. And honestly, I think they're learning anyway. I think they don't release tons of new cards at once. And it seems to me that um, whilst, yes, the tower definitely powerful and whatnot, um, there wasn't really like a was is it fair to say there wasn't a ravenous hunter card in there you oh, know sure. like yeah i don't think there was anything that i went this is going to break the game like the new refer up thing um ecclesia that you you had to you know beg <laughs> for a repeal on there was nothing in town like that like i think i think they're learning and at the end of the day they can release something and if it's really bad they can hot fix it next week you know they can they can they can change stuff so yeah, that's kind I of think, what we need yeah hot fixes i think maybe just having like more maybe just introducing hot fixes like if they do the balance patch once a month like maybe giving themselves the opportunity to do a mid-month hot fix on things that are really breaking the game would alleviate the need for all of that and don't get me wrong like i said i i did vote for a test environment i think it'd be cool as a player brilliant would be awesome but thinking practically with the resource they've got, I just, I, I'm, I think it's a pipe dream. Well, I hope it's not a dream because I think it's, I think this is something that they can do. Either they have to do that. I think there's like two choices because honestly speaking, this is, this game has a lot of potential. And if you, if we want to keep building a player base, because some people actually wrote there, I'm a new player. And some guy even, I, I felt really sorry for one guy. He like literally wrote saying that, in the last last eight weeks, I have seven wins. I'm a newbie. I have no idea how to play CCG, but I'm being like smashed, and I feel that I'm being smashed not only because I'm a noob, but because it's all I'm always facing the same deck, and it's destroying me. So I kind of think that either they have to give us the test environment, or they have to have once again a community manager that systematically is in touch, who we can say, okay, hey, you know. Uh, Mr. Community Manager, like this is going on. Something has to be done about this because currently we're facing a meta where this is. But th that's exactly what I'm saying. Like they initially they could make this beta environment very small. Maybe only invite like five people, 
and yeah. then slowly you can grow it people could appeal people could send a message hey eg i want to participate and then they could make a decision i think it's at that point it's doable and honestly speaking with hot fixes i think that they it's possible because they did a hot fix the other day in hhl i don't mm. know if i've showed you uh bj did i show you the lotara sarin card <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the card that basically said you drop a unit and then you can attack the enemy warlord with your warlord and it gives adjacent units flank and plus one plus one. That was I, I played that deck and I had like I think 90% win rate or 98% win rate. I played like 50 games and lost only two, and those two losses were because I played poorly. So it was so broken beyond recognition, like and after one week they nerfed it. They hot fixed yeah. it. So sometimes yeah. you gotta do it. And the thing with that, Ecclesiac, well, again, perhaps not something that we think of from a player perspective, but obviously they'll need to think of from a business side, is that there's no threat to IP, there's no threat to contracts with Games Workshop. Like As soon as you start opening these like beta things where you're releasing things ahead of time in 2024, the age of the internet, right? Everything, all it takes is one person to post something. Uh, you know, there's, there's all of that risk as well. And then what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to sue some individual gamer who, who was trying to help them fix that. It's like, it gets weird. So I don't know. I mean, again, I'd love it, but I don't know. I mean, they could only do it about patches then. Like, I, as I said, it could be there. It could be either about patches or new content. Perhaps for new content, they would not do that because they don't want it to leak. So, and if they do it about patches, then there's nothing, there's no problem with IP because I mean, I mean, not like Games Workshop is going to care if I gave plus one HP to Neurothrope, right? But they will care if I leaked something new ahead of time. So yeah. what they could do is they could let us beta, beta test the patches, not the new content. The new content they could keep for themselves and, you know, you know, just, yeah, that's it. Or, okay. you know what they could do? Uh, just one more little comment. When the new content drops, let's say the Tau drop, right? And, like... We notice that like people are complaining, like you know, tower too strong, yada yada. What they could do is they could say, okay, guys, so hop onto the beta. Let's try a couple of nerfs, and you know, you could, you could then decide which nerfs to do so that it doesn't destroy the faction. So, yeah, there's a lot of room. Let's just say for improvement. Uh, by the way, so we're gonna be discussing the um, changes right now, but you'll have to hop onto BJ's channel to see that part, boys. So. See you there.